Hello, SBI community. My name is Melissa Valdez, and I am the Director of Client Experience for SBI. Our guest today is Gay Gilbert, Executive Vice President of Customer Success at First Advantage. Gay has already implemented a customer success initiative while most companies are just now starting to think about getting started. Anyone in customer success in the early stages of implementation or optimizing a team has a lot to learn from today's show. I hope you enjoy. From SBI's Executive Briefing Center in Dallas, Texas, the most watched and listened to content in B2B sales and marketing, it's the SBI Podcast with your host, Matt Shares. Welcome to the SBI Podcast, a weekly show dedicated to helping you make your number. Today, we're going to demonstrate how customer success grows revenue by retaining and growing customers by proactively managing the customer lifecycle. Why this topic of customer success, and I think why today is going to be so interesting, is because we're going to do it in the context, in a non-software context. And the guest that I'm hosting today, I think, is going to have fascinating information to share relative to customer success. So why this topic? Business models are changing from transaction-based revenue models to subscription-based revenue models, or think consumption-based revenue models. Companies dependent on recurring revenue have to pay special attention to customer renewal rates, revenue retention, and customer lifetime value. So as a result, reactive customer service approaches built to lower the cost to serve are being replaced with proactive customer success approaches built to increase the revenue per customer. So when your customer becomes more successful as a result of using your product, they buy more of it. So wouldn't that be nice if we all had that problem? So my name is Matt Shares. I am the CEO of SBI. I am also your host. Joining me in the studio is my beloved co-host, as always, Melissa Valdez. And Melissa is here to point us and you to resources to advance you along the way to making your number. Thank you, Matt, and welcome to our listeners. Always excited to hear about customer success. Yes, we are we are in that business. So joining me today um, is Gay Gilbert, and Gay is the Executive Vice President of Customer Success at First Advantage. So Gay, welcome to the show, and please introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you, Matt. I'm very excited to be here, and I appreciate uh, being invited to the show. As you mentioned, I'm the Executive Vice President of Customer Success at First Advantage. I'll start with just telling you a little bit about myself and how I got to this place, and I'll tell you a little bit about First Advantage. I, ju- I started my career in human resources, mm-hmm. so and I really followed that path in the human capital management space my entire career. So really working with people and, and people issues. And what's interesting is, to, is how it's evolved over time, started from an HR practitioner to sales uh, to consulting uh, to strategic services around delivering services to customers and then into account management and customer success. Okay. So as I learn about all of that evolution, it's really been exciting to see how that plays out overall into the, the realm of customer success as it relates to people. Gay, I think what's fascinating and, and what I think or hope will be fascinating about our time together is so many people think about customer success they think software as a service, I've got to have customer success that's going to mitigate churn. And all of that is true, but I think today you and I are going to talk about you know, your business, which I'm going to ask you to describe in a little bit, the concept of just managing churn, the concept of making people successful. Melissa and I have clients. Client success is important in consulting. Client success is important in what you all do. And for many of our listeners who are owned by private equity firms and you have a financial sponsor... Yes. There is no faster way to increase enterprise value and for you as an executive to have a bigger exit and be able to buy your dream home in Jackson Hole, Wyoming than having churn mitigation. (laughs) So what Gay and I are talking about isn't customer success. It's your dream home in Jackson Hole that you can buy through churn mitigation. So you better pay attention. So, (laughs) Melissa... Well, based on, based on that, before Gay and I jump into it, can you maybe lay out some breadcrumbs of how uh, our audience can yes. follow along I'm with sorry, Gay and I? I'm sorry, I need to snap out of my dream of the beach house. <laughs> it's not Jackson Hole for me, it's somewhere. Any beach will do. Uh, but if you are in the audience and you would like to follow along, hopefully you have your How to Make Your Number in 2018 workbook handy. If not, push pause, go to sbi.tips forward slash 2018 workbook, and there we will leverage the customer success section on page 411. Wonderful. 
All right, so Gay, maybe to orient the audience before we get into talking about your team, sure. talk a little bit about what First Advantage does. Sure, First Advantage is a technology-enabled services organization, and our focus is pre-employment and post-employment screening. So essentially background screening, drug testing, helping the largest customers in the world find and hire the best talent and manage their risk along the way. That's really the core foundation of what we do. We are a global company. We're located, we have offices and people throughout the world, and we serve about 20,000 customers overall. Mm. So that's just a quick bird's eye view of our organization. What a, yeah, what a great, clear opening. So to begin with and level set, can you share with the audience an overview of your customer success team? Absolutely. So my customer success team has about 92, I think we're at 92 today, customer success uh, managers, leaders, and analysts. Uh, and we focus on our top customers. So that's about top 700 mm -hmm. of the customers that we have are, are what my team focuses on. How we've structured our organization is, is based on verticals uh, and segments. So I have leaders that sit at the top of each vertical. And then as you think about that, I, I think about it a pyramid inside of a vertical where you right. have segments. So you've got strategic, strategic customers. Uh, so I have a strategic team, uh, large customers, and then a mid-market customer base. So in the context of the industries and verticals, we then segment our customers there. And so I have roles that are obviously the experience and level that associate with those segments. Yep. So, Gay, very often one of the things we're seeing, and, and as I as I think about my work uh, with CEOs and, and the problems I'm asked to unpack or challenges I'm asked to, to maybe weigh in on, this concept of driving enterprise value and increasing shareholder yeah. returns is the, the CEO challenge that it comes to. And as I start to pull on the thread, we customer success, client success is a massive piece of this entire client experience that CEOs are trying to solve. And I know you were solved specifically Absolutely. for solving that challenge. So I give that lead in because yes. I know you did some pretty, what I would call bleeding edge work relative to segment hyper segmentation of the customer base yes. just for customer success. So can you talk a little bit about yes how you did that, why you did that, and then what the output of that was as you structured your team? Yes, absolutely. I'm gonna start with just the environment of our customer and how that's changed, because I do think that feeds into mm. why we did what we did. So our customers, when you think about the concept of recruiting and background screening, uh, it's evolved significantly. Yeah. You know, from, from the time many years ago when it used to be private investigators out there trying to learn about people <laughs> to all of the technology now that's in place in recruiting, right? It's really now got, what has moved from a, a different buyer persona from security and compliance to recruiting and talent acquisition and, and the war for talent that's out there along with technology enabling those, those solutions. So our customers are looking to us to become more consultative, right. to become more uh, driving benchmarks. So that's one of the reasons why we've moved into verticals, for example, because each of the verticals that we've identified serve a market where their needs are different. Some of them have regulated needs, for example, that are they're driven by regulations and government mm. requirements. Others are are driven by market requirements or they have high turnover, for example. So their, their needs are different of high volume recruiting, high turnover recruiting. So we, we, when we look at our segments, we really look at how do we make sure that we build the expertise, knowledge, where we can consult with our customers, we can build benchmarks for our customers and guide them to what does a good program look like and how can they be optimized uh, most effectively. So Gay, if I'm, uh, that's a great answer. Um, so if I understand you correctly, it wasn't just, hey, there's pre-employment screening and no matter, it gets done in healthcare, it gets done in tech enabled, in, in TMT, it gets done in manufacturing. The needs were such at a vertical standpoint, no different than you would structure a hunting team and say, I would call yep. on healthcare and Melissa would call manufacturing and you might call on, on telco. That mm -hmm. same segmentation mentality needed to happen on the back end, especially in a tech-enabled services organization where you have a consumption model, not a contracted recurring revenue model. Is that, is that, is that fair? Absolutely, and, and that 
focus on the verticals of that understanding of the customer keeps them ordering, right? Because they, it's that mm. always adding value focus that we have to have because we are not software as a service where if they don't, yes. if they don't log in, we still get paid. If they yeah. don't order, we don't get paid. So adding value every day is something that we have to do for our customers from a customer success perspective and making sure we're removing the noise. Yeah. You know, it's gay. It's interesting when you talk about, um, the reason you went to that hyper-segmentation. Very often in software companies, the, the marketing motion and customer success is value messaging, right? I'm sending you notes and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm letting you know all the value you can extract from my software tool. In tech-enabled services and anything mm -hmm. consumption-based, my business, your business, it's gotta be a human being yep. that is doing the value messaging. So for those listening, what Gay just articulated to you effortlessly is value messaging, right? in a non, you know, recurring revenue business to ensure that you have customers who continue to, to engage with you. So, Gay, knowing that, how do you keep the segmentation current and relevant and fresh yeah. so that you're properly allocated against those key verticals? There's a next level of segmentation I wanna talk about that really helps us keep it relevant and also helps me align our teams and our people, which is looking at it, within the segments, the types of accounts and customers that we have. Uh, we have customers that have what they've used, they use all of our services. So our footprint is, is high and wide and deep. And so our focus on those customers is to serve and protect, right? right? To retain them and have a very strong focus on making sure that we retain that revenue, we retain that relationship. Yep. We have other customers on, on the other side of the spectrum, which are we have a small piece of the business and there may be another competitor, for example, that has a larger market share of that footprint. And so we want to focus on um, aligning our relationships and our people that have that eye to pursue, right? That they're looking at that customer with that eye to say, how do I displace that competitor? How do I use all my resources, my best practices, my, my innovation strategies, my sales strategies to, to pursue and get the rest of that business? And then we have the customers that are in the middle where they, mm. we have a, a large footprint. We have more to gain, you yeah. know, so how do you make sure that we're delivering on the relationship, rate, retaining the revenue, but have an eye on continuing to get more business there. So segmentation, we're always looking at making sure within the context of our, of our strategic large and mid segments that I talked about earlier, that we're balancing and understanding the, the mix of our products and, and how we're evolving those customers and relationships. So, Gay, um, so I get strategic large, mid, makes sense. Then there's this whole concept mm -hmm. of buyer segmentation and thinking about the buyers inside those verticals, no different than you would segment buyers if you were upfront on a new logo team. So how should a customer success team leverage buyer personas and positioning statements? So for me, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about buyer personas at a basic level, right? You've got procurement and you've got finance yeah. operations. We've, we've built a model around it that, that tells a story and links our, our buyers within that model. We call it the four factors. And, and it's the four factors that our customers have to balance around our programs. So mm. they're managing risk, as I mentioned. That's what our, why would they do background screening, right? If they didn't have to, right? It's managing risk in their business. It's speed and time to hire. So speed is very important to our customers. It's the candidate experience in the, in the process, and then it's the cost. So when you think about the buyer personas, it's really linking the personas to those four factors. So we create a model that's very easy for us to understand because it helps, our, helps us understand who do we need to be talking to based on what the customer cares most about or how they balance those four factors. Yeah. So risk management, right? There's security and compliance buyers. In, in the speed, it's it's recruiting, it's hiring managers. They just yep. care about getting butts and seats. In the candidate experience, the HR, the brand, uh, recruiting as well. And then in cost, of course, it's the procurement and vendor management. So we, we link our personas into those four factors. And when we have conversations with our customers, we, we understand what the key drivers are. So yep. we can make sure, A, we have the right people in the room for the discussion, or B, if cost becomes a factor, for example, then we make we have to make sure we have to look at the other factors and say, what might we have to give up yep. in those other factors in order to service that persona? Does that help? Yeah, that was that was a great answer. I'm, I am going to shamelessly uh, steal the four factors. <laughs> 
So for those those that are listening and watching, um, Gay just gave you all kinds of goodies in this first segment, but the clarity with which she speaks of, not just the fact they have personas, but inside the hypersegmentation of the verticals and what the experience that each of those individual personas are expecting when they interact with their product in a consumption-based model. That's the the academic definition of the business model that Gay just walked you through. That was fascinating, and that was great. So, Melissa, I gotta take a break to let my head shrink while mm-hmm. I stuffed it full of knowledge. Yes. I think you have something to share with the audience <laughs> while Gay and I recoup for segment two. Yes, take a breath, Matt, just take a deep breath. Um, for those of you out there, it's the first quarter. That means you have your revenue target for the year, and you may be wondering how you're going to make your number this year. We have a lot of year left uh, to think about that. SBI has built a interactive tool just for you. It is a web-based self-assessment. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes for you to answer a few questions and you can evaluate the probability of you making your number for the year. To get this fantastic tool, you'll go to sbi.tips forward slash revenue growth diagnostic. Great, thanks Melissa. So you're listening and watching the SBI podcast. I'm your host, Matt Shares, and my fabulous guest today is Gay Gilbert. Gay is the Executive Vice President of Customer Success at First Advantage. And Gay and I are demonstrating how customer success grows revenue and enterprise value. So we're gonna jump back into the questions. So Gay, you, I know, as we visited before the show, are sort of in the midst of a customer success transformation. What I would simply say is going from customer care to true customer success. So how do you think through what are the right plays? Do I have the right people? Do I have a compelling customer success vision? Unpack a little bit of that almost like at a framework level for us, if you could. Yeah, I'm going to start with where where did we where were we that really took us on this journey? And as many companies are like us, we we have grown through acquisition. Yep. And when you grow through acquisition, you know you're bringing multiple companies, platforms, people, cultures together, and even customer relationships and how customers buy. So starting from there, that alone, you know, caused some attrition yep. with, within our customer base. So when, as we stabilized to a a single platform from a tech-enabled services perspective into a single model, um, we then really needed to focus on customer and revenue retention and then taking our customers into the journey into this new model. So those there were, there were customers that obviously had to transition. There were customers that stayed in the, in the place that we were. So what my focus was in order to move from that, what I'll call that firefighting, tactical, escalation management role of yeah. what we were. We were called account we were called account managers, but really I think we were almost that third tier customer service yeah. because we were just helping customers move, you know, to a more stabilized and operationalized state. So that once they were there, my focus was taking us to that next level. So how do we, as I mentioned earlier, build those relationships that we can add value build that build that trust with our customers show the innovation strategy communicate right. where we're going next yep. so one of the first things that I did was when I joined the organization uh, to begin the transformation effort is I evaluated the work so what are they doing today and what I found out um, just by nature of the story that I just told you is that they were doing pretty much everything in the kitchen sink customer service account management sales implementation right. you know chasing things around the building to get answers for customers and so on and so forth. And so I needed to break that work down first and make sure I put the right work in the right place because I can't get to customer success until I get some of that work where it belongs. So customer service to customer service, implementation to implementation. So we could then say, okay, this is now our job. This is what customer success looks like at first advantage. And so then the next step with is exactly once you get the job clarified, you know exactly what you need to do, then it's important to assess talent, right? To look at your talent and say, do I have the right people now in this new world to, yeah. to deliver on the mission, of, the mission of customer success? And so that was the next step for me is to say, let's look at our talent now that we've got the, the job clearly defined and make sure we've got the right people to make that, to cross that chasm of, from account management and customer service to true customer success. And that's a journey, you know, it's yeah. building a bench and it's, you know, 
changing some relationships that you have with customers, it's very delicate because you know you want to move you know, to, a, to a better customer success model, but there's deep relationships with customers that have been built that you have to be sensitive about as you're thinking through those transitions. So we're continuing to move that forward uh, and make those changes. In addition to that, we've, we've had to build better systems and processes to manage the customer data, how we report on it, how we manage risk, how we communicate internally, all of that really feeds into a successful evolution to customer success. We're still um, we're still on the journey. Yeah. We have still much work to do, but it's exciting to see some of the changes we've been able to accomplish in less than a year. Yeah, I think one of the things about the journey that that you all went on is, um, I would say that you were you were objective and agnostic relative to first understanding the customer journey and those touch points, and then saying, what are the competencies I need at those critical points of leverage to have a great experience, as opposed to going, boy, Sally and Mike and Bob and Dave are all good guys, good girls, so they can do that. You you were, and and maybe because you came in from the outside, you didn't have some of the, the historical, so you were able to truly be objective. And I would tell you, for the folks that are listening, And so many people, I mean, this is one of the top three things that when we're getting, when the phone is ringing, people are asking us to work on this challenge. People have a really hard time going through that transformation, but also being outward in enough to look at the customer journey and not say, so-and-so can do that, saying, what's the competency required at that sort of moment of truth, point of leverage? to make the customer experience what it needs to be. So I, I applaud you for, for doing that and having the rigor to stick with yeah. it, which leads me to my next question. How did you, mm-hmm. when you think about those core competencies and your hiring process, talk a little bit about the right talent for this role. What does good customer success talent look like in your opinion? So um, absolutely somebody who has the ability to consult with a customer and how I define consult is, you know, curiosity is, is key, uh, who, who can really dissect and understand a customer's process because in, until you understand the customer's process, the business and the problems that they're trying to solve, it's very difficult to align the solutions and to really drive that value that we talked about. Yeah. So the competencies that we, that we established were, were very much around that, those core customer success competencies Certainly account management competencies, but those and also operational and leadership competencies. Right. In our business, while it may sound like a, like a simple business as far as pre-employment screening, it's actually very complex. Yeah. So we also have to make sure as we're evolving those competencies and those models that we, we make sure we maintain the subject matter expertise in our business around our products and services yeah. so that we don't have to be all to all, that we yeah. have the ability to become, become the quarterback you know, in an account, in a, in a customer situation, and bring in the subject matter expert resources to to provide the value to the customer. Yeah. Gay, as you think about, like, career paths and customer success, I mean, this is in the maturity of, of certain roles, customer success is, like, mm-hmm. you know, very immature, right? It's, it's, it's like it's a toddler right now <laughs> re- relative to its evolution <laughs> in, in mainstream. Well, are, there, are there natural career paths that... that either lead people to customer success or when they get into customer success that they can move, you know, into two or three different roles. How do you think about that? I think there's absolutely natural career paths and it, it depends on the organization. So in my organization, because there are there is some product knowledge that is very beneficial into a customer success role, if somebody has that strong product knowledge but also has the those competencies of customer success, that ability to be consultative, uh, it's, a, it's a great step to combine those two together. Mm. Uh, so, so it could be coming from product, it could be coming from like a solutions engineering side, from sales, um, even from customer service, depending on, on the types of people you hire in that role. When you think about just hiring somebody that's hungry out of college, yeah. that's, very, that's a good starting point learn your business and they could grow in there, but you do have to teach them how to be, how to be a good customer success leader. Um, So I think that, and then, and then moving from customer success, I think there's certainly the, the, the career path within the organization and moving up into management roles, getting up into more strategic accounts, taking on broader, higher revenue, higher, higher impact customers is a career path. 
and then moving out into other parts of the organization into product management where you can influence the product. So I think I think there's a lot of opportunities based on the type of business that you're in and and the knowledge that you bring to your organization and the customers. Fantastic. So my last question in this segment is: um, Are there are there a set of plays? Like if if I'm a traditional sales leader and I run a sales team, I say there's four, five, six plays that we run to bring in a big deal, right? As we sort of spread out and get to know the influencers and maybe do a demo and a POC. Do you have a similar, you know, customer success motion where you teach the team to run a set of plays at the right time? How do you think about that? So absolutely. So even though we talked about being a consumption-based model, we still have contracts that are based on a time length. So whether it's three years or five years. So we run plays based on that because our customers, you know, they, even though they can, they can leave at any time, essentially, they still, they stay with us for the period of the contract and they go through a renewal process or an RFP. So that is one play, right? Always paying attention to the renewals and making sure that we are, we are well prepared. We circumvent RFPs uh, wherever we can. And we, we retain those customers, you know, for much longer for life, you know, as our target. So that's one that really looking out for that. Um, other plays are um, changes. So we are in our business, we are connected to other technology inside of our customers. Right. So if those customers replace a piece of technology that we're connected to, it's an event that we have to be on top of. So we run those plays to make sure that we leverage our relationships with those partners um, through the partner channels to make sure if if they're replacing a different piece of technology that we're well in line to link to the new one. So that's another one. So being very sensitive to that. Acquisitions and mergers, there's yeah. there's plays around that when they're acquired. Um, very sensitive to that. Change in ownership of the program. Um, I could go on and on, but yeah. those are some of the top level ones. So very good. So as we head to a, uh, another break, and Melissa's going to give you some information, what you should take from this segment with Gay is the the discipline and the methodology through which she is has built and is continuing to evolve customer success at first advantage. And the question you should be asking yourself is, do you have the organizational patience to actually put a framework in place no different than 15 years ago you would have put a framework in place to you know, stand up a new sales channel or product overlays? Or eight years ago, put in a framework to run marketing campaigns and marketing discipline. Same level of rigor, same level of complexity, but for all the right reasons. So with that, Melissa, I think you've got something to share with our audience. Absolutely, and I think a lot of our listeners and viewers out there uh, can resonate with everything that uh, Gay is talking about today with you, Matt, of course, and uh, hear the inc- excitement in your voice yes, as well about I love uh, this cus- topic. a customer success program. We love this topic around here. <laughs> but you don't have to go at it alone if this is something you want to take on. Please reach out to SBI. Our subject matter experts are here to help you. I encourage you to look into hosting an interactive workshop with one of our SMEs or a team of our experts. We'd love to have you down here at the studio in Dallas, Texas, and talk about how we can build a customer success framework in partnership with you all. And to get a feel for what's covered in the workshops, you'll go to sbi.tips forward slash 2018 workbook. That's our last segment with Gay, and Gay and I are demonstrating customer success, so we're going to jump back into the questions. So, Gay, you talked a lot about running the function, standing it up, what was required, talent, segmentation. Let's talk about that whole thing of executive alignment and support, because what I have seen is it's, it's a company thing, it's not a function thing, right, relative to getting customer success right. Um, How did you get, or how do you get the organization to rally around you and the function? It's such a great question. And I'll start with what you said, which is it takes a village to make a customer successful. There's no question. I mean, we have to make sure that, you know, our products are great, we're selling effectively, we're implementing effectively, all of those pieces. But what really gets an executive team's attention is we're all about revenue. So I think you, you start there and we, we talk about the fact that we are a revenue team. I know we've talked about building a foundation and people and all those things, but it really comes down to that. Yeah. And, and retaining that revenue is, is what helps us catapult our growth to the next level as you think about it year over year. So number one, that's, 
that's what we talk about is revenue. So mm -hmm. if you start with that as a foundation and you talk about what prevents us from retaining revenue, it, it gets people's attention, you know, especially at the executive team. So, so number one is, is talking about revenue. Number yeah. two is, is, is the risk. What's the risk to the revenue? So the executives, uh, I'm just grateful in my organization that, that we have a cadence where we talk about our customers uh, on a weekly basis uh, and those customers that are at risk. For example, those customers that are out for RFP uh, with the top executives uh, around what do we need? What do we yeah. need from the organization to make sure that we're mitigating this risk and we've got a plan of action in place and, and everyone shows up um, every week for these calls. We talk about customers that are out for RFP to make sure that we have a win strategy. Um, so it's, it's very refreshing to have that kind of, of support in this organization uh, and it makes a big difference. In that's, addition to that, yeah, we that's have a lot of exactly, rigor. yeah, it is, it yeah. is. We also have executive sponsors on our top account. So we put our executives to work so that they're spending time with our customers, our top customers, getting to know them, hearing what's happening in our customers, you know, both all the great things that is happening in our in our are happening in our customer relationships, but also some of the challenges our customers have, so that we can use that, leverage their knowledge to right. influence whether it's our product roadmap or how we do things uh, internally as well. So Gay, on that topic, um, how have you, it sounds like you've got a good cadence with sales. Um, you know, you know what's going out to RFP, you know where you might have risk, you got win strategies, I mean, that's a lot of discipline. How do you interlock with marketing? What's marketing's role at First Advantage relative to customer success? So marketing's role is, is absolutely critical and it's something I'm very passionate about because, you know, one-on-one -on -one ground combat, you know, or ground support of customer is, can only get you so far. So yeah. you need that air strategy. And that's what I look at marketing is really that air cover for us. And to, to do a couple of things, to educate our customers, to, to get them excited about what's coming in our business, to, to talk about those best practices and benchmark data that, we, that, that yeah. I mentioned earlier. So our customers are hungry for that. They're hungry to understand what other, what other customers are doing and, and leveraging customer marketing is, is a critical component of that. So I think we have an opportunity to always do that better and, and more um, and in different ways because customers like all of us get a lot of emails. So how do you leverage that through different ways, different mechanisms for learning, different you know gamification of, of learning systems and things like that to yeah. engage your customers in different ways. Yep. <clears throat> so Gay, what are, uh, as it relates to evaluating success on an ongoing basis, and you talked about it comes down to being about revenue. What are the top metrics yep. that uh, the CEO cares about and that you're tracking as you think about the allocation of people, money, and time to make customer success effective? Revenue, for sure. Um, revenue revenue growth or revenue attrition um, is the number, number one. We look yep. at that very closely. Yep. Uh, NPS. NPS scores, so we make sure we understand where our customers fit in our in our net promoter scores. What are some other pieces? The number of a number of customers that are offer RP. Those those are some that come to mind as yeah. I think of some additional ones. But well, but know. I mean, you know, just another thing to note. I mean, this is a CEO initiative at at First Advantage. This is this is not something. I mean, they went out and got you and. Huh? You're, you're, you were not, you're not inexpensive, right? And you come with a lot of experience and you've got a team. I mean, this is not something that's just, yeah, we're doing customer success because everybody's doing it. I mean, this was a big bet that the company made to driving enterprise value. So Gay, Gay, if you had, I guess my last question for you, if you had a piece of advice looking back a year ago and you think about going on the journey and somebody was you 12 months ago, and you could give them one piece of advice relative to moving on this journey to really operationalizing customer success, what would that be? I think my number one piece of advice is to know your customers and understand the problems that they're trying to solve. Uh, because when you really get deep there, every all of the solutions, all of the ways you structure your organization, who you bring into that customer relationship to retain and grow, um, gets defined yeah. from that. Yeah. Well, 
for the audience uh, members listening and watching, can't thank Gay enough for spending some of her valuable time and incredibly valuable insight to what is a hot topic for everybody. If I may add an exclamation point, if you think about where the world is he has headed with B2C, the motion of having a highly personalized experience as a consumer, the same motion has moved into B2B. So if you think about client experience or customer experience, customer success is that last critical barbell if you think about how you move from left to right, from a prospect to winning a customer to their first experience with you when they pay you to then having some level of emotion that keeps them with you, whether consumption-based, contractual. So, um, Gay, thank you on behalf of myself, Melissa, the SBI community, for spending time with us. This was great. Um, Melissa, I think you have one more thing to share. Yes, and uh, Gay, I'll have to send you a picture of the notes that I'm taking because it's pretty messy on here on these pages <laughs> down here. <laughs> but thank you for that demonstration. And for those of you in the audience who are listening, whether you've been a longtime listener or you've just decided to join us, we are always looking for fantastic guests like Gay to appear on the show. We don't know everybody, so we need your help. If you have a compelling story that you would like to share within the B2B sales and marketing community, I encourage you to reach out to me and we'll see if we can get you on the show. We feature less than 100 people per year, so it's definitely exclusive and we'll get you down here to Dallas at our studio and, and uh, have a great time filming a show in person. But you can find me through our website at salesbenchmarkindex.com or the easier route, just look for me on LinkedIn. Very Thanks, good, Matt. thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. So Gay, thank you so much for taking time to spend with us, I appreciate it. Absolutely, it's been great to work with you and your team. Well, that's sweet of you to say, so thanks very much. And as always, uh, to the audience members and listeners, uh, viewers, you have a choice where you spend your 30 minutes, so I appreciate you uh, putting me in your ears or putting your eyes on us. That's all we have for today, and as always, until next time, I wish you good luck as you try and make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on the studio, SBI's Executive Briefing Center, our team, or to schedule a workshop, please visit salesbenchmarkindex.com.